Welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to discuss three common complications of prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, retinopathy of prematurity, as well as germinal matrix and intraventricular hemorrhage. So let's dive in. First up, we've got bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which has a wide range of definitions, but it's most commonly characterized as being a chronic lung disease that requires oxygen supplementation at postmenstrual age of 36 weeks. Now, the reason why this postmenstrual age is given is because prematurity is one of the biggest risk factors for developing bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And as this is a chronic disease, it helps to differentiate it from a condition like respiratory distress syndrome, which occurs shortly after birth. So this chronic disease is caused by a number of factors resulting in inflammation and injury. Preterm birth, especially birth before 28 weeks gestational age, leaves neonates at risk for surfactant deficiency, as well as underdeveloped antioxidant mechanisms and airway-supported structures. Now, intrauterine growth restriction, even in term infants, can also result in bronchopulmonary dysplasia, as can early mechanical ventilation use in neonates. As I mentioned, preterm neonates have underdeveloped antioxidant mechanisms, so if they require supplemental oxygen to maintain adequate blood oxygen levels, they're at risk for developing oxygen toxicity in the lungs, with damage resulting in that bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Pro-inflammatory cytokines, either due to infection or some other inflammatory mechanism, can cause damage to fetal or neonatal lungs, as can inflammation caused by maternal smoking. Now, the signs and symptoms you most commonly see include tachypnea with intercostal and subcostal retractions, possible rails, as well as expiratory wheezes that you'll hear on auscultation. Imaging consistent with this condition includes chest radiography showing interstitial lung markings and diffuse haziness, hyperinflation, and fibrotic changes such as cystic areas. Now, on labs, the ABG can show hypoxemia and possibly hypercapnia. Now, the diagnosis is made when there's a need for oxygen supplementation at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. An oxygen reduction test can also be used to confirm this need. And this test involves taking an infant and placing them on room air temporarily. And if the oxygen saturation falls below 90% within 60 minutes, we would consider that test finding positive. Now, patients will usually show improvement over time as they age and as the lungs mature. However, those with the most serious cases will continue to require mechanical ventilation and supplemental oxygen, followed by weaning to either CPAP or high-flow nasal cannula with supplemental oxygen, eventually just requiring supplemental oxygen alone, and eventually, of course, being able to breathe solely on room air. Now, for patients requiring mechanical ventilation, low tidal volumes are used because we want to avoid volume trauma, and positive end expiratory pressure of around 5 is used to avoid atelectasis. Now, for preterm infants, pulse ox is made between not, maintained between 90 and 95% to both treat hypoxemia, but also to limit exposure to excessive oxygen, which can, of course, cause oxygen toxicity. That can lead to retinopathy of prematurity, which we'll discuss shortly. Once the neonate reaches term age, the pulse ox parameters can be increased to 100%. Patients with less severe disease may start at any point in this progression. For example, they may only need CPAP and improve to no longer requiring respiratory support at all. Supportive care is also extremely important because lung growth and maturity is going to depend on factors such as adequate nutrition. Fluid intake is also carefully monitored to avoid pulmonary edema as a result of fluid overload. And due to the structural changes seen in bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the risk of pulmonary hypertension is elevated, so patients are also monitored for this complication. Next up, let's take a look at retinopathy of prematurity. Now, this condition arises when there's incomplete retinal vascularization seen in the preterm infant. This leads to visual defects. Now, what happens here is initially there will be some sort of insult to the vasculature of the eye. This could be oxygen toxicity or a lack of adequate perfusion due to hypoxemia or hypotension. Then, following this insult, New blood vessels will grow abnormally out from the retina into the vitreous, which is that gel-like substance in the eye. This can cause edema and hemorrhage and possibly even lead to the development of fibrovascular tissue that can contract, tear, and distort or detach the retina. Now, there's a number of risk factors for retinopathy of prematurity, with prematurity being the most important. But there are dozens of other associated diseases, treatments, as well as comorbidities that are implicated. Now, rather than memorize every single risk factor, in general, patients who are premature and or those who are ill enough to require intensive interventions, those who have severe lab abnormalities, or those with, with very serious comorbidities or infections are all at an increased risk. Now, in addition to those factors, 
alterations in growth factors associated with neovascularization of blood vessels in the eyes, such as vascular endothelial growth factor and insulin-like growth factor 1, can also be implicated in this condition. Now, when it comes to the signs and symptoms here, you might see visual impairment, leukocoria, myopia, nystagmus, and even strabismus. Now, the diagnosis and classification is made by a pediatric ophthalmologist, and we're going to use a dilated eye exam to document the location and extent of the condition. Now, all patients born with a weight of 1,500 grams or less, or with a gestational age of 30 weeks or less, should undergo screening with several eye exams. Now, treatment here involves laser photocoagulation or the administration of an anti-BEGF agent, such as bevacizumab, um, and we'll use those for severe cases. As well, we'll continue surveillance for less severe disease cases. Now, if retinopathy of prematurity progresses to retinal detachment, surgical reattachment of the retina will be performed. Our final topic is germinal matrix intraventricular hemorrhage. Now, this condition is characterized by bleeding that begins in the germinal matrix because of structural instability of the region, especially in preterm and low birth weight infants. Now, it's fairly rare for a term infant to have this condition unless they have some sort of genetic disorder that affects the stability of the vessels in the region or affecting coagulation factors and or platelets. Other risk factors, aside from being born preterm and low birth weight, include having respiratory distress syndrome that would require mechanical ventilation, needing to be transferred to another institute for a higher level of care, prolonged neonatal resuscitation, uh, prolonged resuscitation after birth, as well as chorioamnionitis. Patients with mothers given antenatal glucocorticoid therapy in anticipation of preterm birth occurring in the next one to seven days tend to less frequently be affected by this, spe this specific type of hemorrhage. Some patients with this condition might initially be asymptomatic, but most will present with altered consciousness, abnormal eye position and movements, as well as a decrease in both spontaneous movements and movements in response to a stimulus. Patients may also show hypotonia or have irregular breathing patterns. In this case, symptoms are usually going to arise over hours to days. Now, in severe cases, symptoms develop within minutes to hours, and they can include coma, seizures, irregular breathing, apnea, hemodynamic instability that is characterized by both hypotension and bradycardia, decerebrate posturing, fixed pupils or other cranial nerve abnormalities, as well as a bulging anterior, anterior fontanelle. The diagnosis here is made using cranial ultrasound, allowing for direct visualization of blood that's present in the germinal matrix, the ventricles, or even the cerebral parenchyma. The ultrasound is used to grade the severity of the bleed, depending on the location and the extent of the bleed, as well as determine if there's any ventricular dilation present. Now, all preterm infants under 32 weeks gestational age should receive cranial ultrasound screening to assess for silent hemorrhage because, as I mentioned earlier, many cases may initially be asymptomatic. Now, in terms of lab findings that we need to watch out for, the presence of red blood cells and high protein concentration are consistent with an intraventricular hemorrhage. A few hours after hemorrhage into the ventricles, xanthochromia can develop. Now, a lumbar puncture should only be performed after a cranial ultrasound is done because if we've got a, a enlarged third but a small fourth ventricle, aqueductal stenosis is probably present and there's a risk of herniation with lumbar puncture. Now, in terms of treatment, there's no specific treatment for this condition. Management is going to be aimed at minimizing complications. This includes trying to provide adequate brain perfusion as well as oxygenation by controlling hemodynamics, oxygenation, and ventilation. Now, fluid status and nutrition are also closely monitored. Patients should be tr promptly treated for the development of seizures, with phenobarbital being the anti-seizure drug of choice in this scenario. Now, if post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilation with increased intracranial pressure is present, the patient should receive neurosurgical intervention with a ventricular access device to remove CSF to decrease intracranial pressure. If the intracranial pressure is dangerously high and immediate intervention is necessary, serial lumbar punctures may also need to be performed. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. Correct answer here is B. Next question. 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back.
correct answer here is A. And your final question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back. Correct answer here is D. All right, guys, that is the end of this lecture. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.